So we had started to look at the discrete Fourier transform, where we're, we're deciding now where we are sampling on, uh, in frequency, which turns out to be around the, uh, the unit circle. Um, and these are the uh, definitions of the discrete Fourier transforms that we're using. The forward transform from time to uh, frequency, the inverse transform from frequency back to time. And we now have the sampled frequency here. Something that I realized last time that, that I never pointed out before, um, maybe because it was just too obvious to me, but that's expecting a lot, is that we have the same number of time samples as we do frequency samples. Big N is the number of time samples. Big N is the number of frequency samples. So uh, uh, hopefully that makes sense to you uh, in terms of information theory. Um, then uh, we realized that, that we could express, we could wrap up this summation uh, and get the components. You know, Here, this summation gets us one component, one component of the Fourier transform at one frequency with index j. Uh, so we have to do that summation many times to get many different uh, frequency components. Uh, so this is essentially a matrix operation that, we, that we're expressing as a, as a matrix multiplication. So this column vector is the number of time points uh, tall. And this column vector on the left is the number of frequency points tall. And you can see here I've used a um, I've used four points for each one, uh, four time samples, four frequency samples, and so this U matrix here, or sometimes I call it the W matrix, is actually um, four by four, and it's square. Okay, and here's the definition of of W. Okay. And you can see here that there's this concept of a, of a frequency uh, a minimum uh, frequency or, or frequency resolution, which is 2 pi over, over n uh, radians per second, I believe. So the, um, uh, this W matrix or U matrix is uh, uh, since the Ws are, are uh, Euler expo exponents uh, and just have magnitude one, right? Um, there are there's nothing there's no uh, component of the matrix that is zero, and so also there's no there's going to be no zero eigenvalues. There's there's no um, there's no breakdown in inverting this matrix and being square that makes it particularly easy. So here's the inverse of the matrix, which you can almost write down by inspection, um, and you can see that it looks just you know the the inverse discrete Fourier transform, the inverse DFT, uh, is a matrix that looks very much like the uh, the forward DFT, except that uh, for all the exponents of W uh, here, uh, we just put a minus sign uh, in front of them. And uh, so it's that's really a uh, that comes out to be a one character change in a in a program that, that implements this. Now, of course, this is using the sign convention that that physicists and geophysicists like to use. So uh, uh, you know your your results may may vary when uh, you're using software prepared by electrical engineers. Uh, they may have different exponents. But this is the way that we like to do it, and the way that our software uh, will will take the signs. Okay, so uh, there are some uh, uh, some very nice things about this uh, um, this forward and inverse uh, discrete Fourier transform. Of course, uh, to really have the inverse, we must have this to be true. Uh, U inverse acting on U is equal to uh, some um, some scalar alpha, you know, some scale factor times the identity matrix. And, and just to refresh your memory, here is a four by four identity matrix. Basically, along the diagonal of the matrix, uh, it's all one, and everywhere else in the matrix, it's zero. 
and an identity ma matrix must be square, and an identity matrix um, can be any size, uh, you know, uh, that's square. Uh, it can be one by one, conceivably. That's not very useful, um, but it can. Uh, an identity matrix can clearly be uh, uh, have have dimensions in the millions or billions. Uh, that only adds computational difficulty, not not algebra, you know, not necessarily algebraic difficulty. Okay, so the off-diagonal elements of of u inverse acting on u must all be zero. Okay, so uh, let's write down a few off-diagonal elements of of u inverse uh, times u, just to just to inspect, you know, what's what's happening here. Okay. And and what you know, what are the are there some conditions on this on this inverse? Are there ways that we have to arrange things to make sure that this inverse that I'm showing you uh, is truly the inverse? Okay, so let's look at u inverse u, um, uh, which is a uh, a four by four matrix. Let's look at it at, at row one, element two, and that's going to be one plus w to the minus 1 power plus w to the minus 2 plus w to the minus 3. We could also look at uh, u inverse u, uh, second row, first column, which is going to be 1 plus w plus w squared plus w to the third power. OK, well, here is, is w is equal to e to the i omega 0. OK, and um, our, delta, our delta omega, right? Is uh, two pi over four, right? N is four. This is also our, our omega zero, and that's pi over two. Okay. So um, what we've uh, what we've got here is uh, you know uh, w to the zero is equal to one. Okay. So there's one, right? W to the uh, uh, to the first power. Or uh, to the minus one. Well, w to the first power is um, is up here on the unit circle at uh, uh, at ninety degrees. Okay, w squared is just e to the i pi, so that's over here at minus one. Uh, w to the third power is e to the i uh, two pi. I'm sorry, three pi over two, and so uh, that's over here at uh, zero uh, uh, minus i. Uh, and then uh, 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 for the first one here, you know, w to the minus one. That's just the e to the minus i pi over two, right? So we just come come down from the uh, uh, from w from one by minus ninety degrees. And here's w to the minus two e to the minus i pi, w to the minus three e to the minus i three pi over two, right? Just uh, just here. Um, now, as long as these vectors are radially symmetric, right? These are complex numbers that we're adding up here. So as long as these vectors are radially symmetric, they're going to sum to zero, right? So one is one plus i zero. W to the first power is zero plus plus uh, one i. W squared is minus one plus uh, i zero. Uh, w to the third power is um, zero plus uh, uh, i minus one. Okay, and you sum all these together: one plus zero minus one plus zero. You get zero. On the uh, imaginary uh, side, you get zero plus one plus zero minus one, and that also gives you zero. So zero plus i zero is zero. Okay, so that all works, uh, and that off-diagonal element is um, is zero. Okay. Uh, and this is a it gives you an interesting concept here, you know, uh, w is e to the two pi i over n, right? And really, what that is is the nth root of one. Okay, so so uh, uh, because w can be complex, you know, these uh, uh, these roots are just you know rotating around the the unit circle. Okay. And the, uh, uh, the the magnitude is always the distance from the origin is always one, okay? It's always on the unit circle, but um, 
you know, if they're if they're uh, arranged correctly, then they're going to add to one. Now, this this you know simple four by four um, is uh, is pretty easy, uh, but there are here uh, some conditions on n and on uh, omega zero. Okay. Uh, on this uh, on this delta omega, I should have I should have made that omega zero there, uh, but sometimes I call it delta omega, and and here I'm also calling it omega zero. Um, so uh, uh, you know here we're using n as an even number, right? And that's important, right? Because if we had five points around the unit circle here, it'd be kind of hard to uh, uh, it it might be harder to to get them arranged right. Uh, also, uh, omega zero is two pi over n. Okay, so we need to we need to um, you know there's several kind of boundary conditions on this you know that make that make the uh, the inverse Fourier transform a perfect inverse right we don't if we can find a way to make it a perfect in, inverse we want to do that because we you know uh, a perfect you know, mathematically perfect inverse Fourier transform is extremely useful. Uh, so we'd rather arrange things so that we have a, you know, all these off-diagonal elements are zero, and and um, you know, u inverse u is always a uh, uh, an identity matrix. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, n is even. Uh, omega zero is two pi over n, and uh, uh, omega to the zero power is equal to one. That's not necessarily true, right? I mean, you can you can uh, arrange these w's anywhere around the circle, okay? And they can have any spacing, um, and uh, uh, and we could still do the forward transform, the forward Fourier transform, right? We just wouldn't we don't necessarily have to have the zero frequency component. We could get it at other frequencies equivalently. Uh, but we can see that if we start with uh, w to the to the zeroth power, in other words, the the first sample in the uh, in the Fourier transform is at zero frequency. Okay, zero frequency sometimes is called the direct current component. I'll, I'll often say the DC component. You know, there's no no change with time. It's not wavy, right? We uh, we like to analyze that. It's it's another way of putting it. It's the average value of the time series. You know, so if you for seismograms, the DC component should be zero, and when you have a DC component that's not zero, you know you have a bias in your seismogram. You've got to take out. I mean, seismograms should swing equally positive and negative. Um, uh, at least velocity seismograms should, but. Um, uh, displacement seismograms, of course, have biases. You know, they have offsets. So, uh, so those have a non-zero DC component. So, here are some conditions which we won't have much trouble meeting, uh, which make the um, which make it invertible. Okay. So, the discrete Fourier transform is perfectly invertible. We can, we can, you know, mathematically now we can go back and forth. You know, with these uh, uh, with these summations as we've defined them, and as long as we hold to those conditions, uh, we can go back and forth as many times as we like. And uh, you know, if we're using high enough precision arithmetic in our computer, um, we'll always get exactly the same answer. Okay, so it's mathematically it's a mathematically pure um, um, inverse. Uh, under these particular conditions, okay. Um, all right. So um, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's that's how we have to set it up. Let me um, let me go to uh, uh, another topic, and uh, because we you know you we're getting the. Uh, um, we're getting the uh, the idea that we have to set uh, this omega zero, and and um, uh, so often in your in your analysis, you know, if you're doing spectral analysis, you may be asked to distinguish, you know, can I 
do I have the data? Can I distinguish between what's at 60 hertz and what's at 60.1 hertz or 60.01 hertz? Okay. What is my frequency resolution? You know, if I'm if I'm uh, uh, to take a, a uh, a perfectly wild example. Um, if I have a time series which is uh, extinctions, um, number of extinctions per million years versus the geologic time scale, and I want to compute a spectrum of that, and I find that there's this supposed uh, nemesis um, uh, uh, planet that is, or nemesis star that's uh, uh, causing mass extinctions uh, at the Earth every uh, 26 million years. I mean, how accurately am I determining that peak? Now we're going to talk more about about uh, when you can when you can see periodicity in spectra. But um, the first question we might ask is, well, is it you know is it 26.1 um, million years? Is it 26.01 million years? What's what's our what's our frequency resolution in that analysis? Okay. And, and you might think here, well, all I have to do is I take my data and I and I get um, um, and if I use a very large n, then I'm going to have a very small omega zero. So I can you know I can actually I can actually do a Fourier transform to any frequency resolution I want. You know if I want one uh, uh, if my Nyquist frequency is 100 hertz and I want 100 I, and I want uh, 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 I want uh, uh, a you know ten thousand ten thousandth of a hertz um, frequency resolution. Then all I have to do is is make n a million. You know take take my take my spectra at a million at a million points of frequency. Okay, does that work? Okay, that's the first question. Uh, so so here's uh, here's where where this class is is really going to be. Um, departing from um, uh, other classes you may have had in, in math departments about Fourier analysis and, and wave motion. We are dealing with time-limited series. We can only record our seismograms for a certain amount of time, you know, often a few minutes um, uh, from, from our uh, exploration activities, a few seconds. Um, from uh, from this this record of extinctions, uh, a few billion years. Okay, that's all we've got. We've got a time limited series. We do not have a, ser a time series. We don't have the data extending to minus infinity. In uh, uh, I should point that way. Minus infinity in uh, in time to positive infinity in time. We don't have it. Okay, so. We have a range of time. You know, we can start at some zero time, and we record data, okay, and we record to some maximum time. All right. So let's let's just say, you know, whatever time we start recording, we'll set that to zero time, and we know that our t max, the maximum length of our recording, the maximum time we record to, is got to be less than infinite. Um, you know, there's only so many protons in the universe we can use. There's about 10 to 60 protons in the universe, so we cannot possibly, uh, you you know, even if we had a, a computer as big as the universe, we couldn't uh, we couldn't record more than uh, 10 to the 60th bits uh, of data. All right, so we're gonna have some maximum time which is less than infinite. The time range then is equal to t max. That's the amount of time we recorded. So then we uh, we sample that time at n points. Okay, so we have a time range, and then we we take our time samples, you know, wherever we can, uh, and we end up with n points. All right. Now we're going to make uh, you know for convenience, we're going to make the number of time points be equal to the number of frequency points. N t is equal to n omega. Okay. Uh, so that means that the uh, let's see, delta t. Is our, our time um, our time sampling is equal to the time range divided by n? Now, in the frequency domain, okay, the maximum frequency that we can uh, represent is um, uh, one over two delta t 
uh, in hertz, okay, uh, or in terms of uh, uh, rotational frequency, omega max is pi over delta t radians per second. Okay, so that's our that's our Nyquist frequency. That's our that's our frequency range. All right, and our frequency range is thus um, extends from uh, over one principal fold. We're going to take the fold from you know minus pi to positive pi. So our frequency range begins at minus two over delta t, and it ends at uh, on the high side at one over two delta t. Okay, so we're including uh, you know half of it as negative frequencies. Okay, so our time resolution delta t is t range over n. Our frequency range is one over delta t, right? Right. There's you know, two times two times one over two delta t is 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 our maximum frequency. Our minimum is minus one over two delta t. So the the frequency range is one over delta t, which is uh, and then substituting in delta t n over t range. That means our frequency resolution. This is as as theoretically as fine as we could distinguish any frequencies, you know, from each other. Okay, uh, is the frequency range over n? Oh, but that is exactly one over the time range. So here is something. Uh, I mean, if you if you if you knew this already, bravo! But but it was a huge surprise to me. Notice that our delta f, our theoretical minimum frequency. You know, maximum frequency resolution, minimum frequency step, is completely independent of n. It's completely independent of delta t. Okay. Uh, it it has only to do with one thing. One thing alone determines, you know, how how much frequency resolution we get. That is the amount of time we record. One thing only. Um, and if you're interested in, in spatial frequency, right? Uh, you know, what is your spatial frequency resolution? That's going to be one over the width of the array, or one over the length that you record over. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about your um, your your. Uh, uh, the number of samples you have in that array doesn't matter. The frequency resolution delta f is just one over the amount of time you record t range, the time range. Um, and and this is uh, it, it's 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 only after some time that this this will start to make sense to you physically. Uh, uh, you know. I love to ask, and here's a hint, you guys, um, on uh, on on uh, qualifying exams, on um, comprehensive exams. I love to ask the question. Um, you know, I'm recording uh, seismograms for uh, for ten seconds, and I'm sampling at a, at one millisecond, uh, and this gives me a. Uh, um, uh, this gives me a frequency resolution of uh, one tenth hertz. Okay, I want frequency resolution of one hundredth hertz. How do, how do I record it differently to get that frequency resolution? And and you know most people will answer, well, you got to go to a a, a uh, you got to take more samples in time. But this page tells you no. That's not going to help at all. The only thing that will get you more frequency resolution is extending your recording, the time of your recording. Uh, so the answer to that question, of course, is uh, uh, record for 100 seconds instead of instead of 10. Um, this is another reason why uh, in in um, why these you know day long or month long seismograms have been so useful. In this uh, empirical Green's function work, because you know 
with more data, you get more frequency resolution into the analysis. Uh, there's more things for the uh, um, for the cross correlations to key on. There are uh, there's more room in the with more data. There's 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 just more room for more information, uh, and there's more ability to cancel out noise. Um, you know this this. Uh, um, the, 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 the folks who came up with empirical reads functions are well aware of this of this um, this theory that that your frequency resolution is the inverse of the time range. So they've been you know they've been great advocates for increasing uh, the lengths of our recording. Okay, so that's uh, um, that's a huge lesson. Um, uh, and uh, I actually, uh, um, I actually uh, submitted a paper uh, early in my career where I, I snipped out little uh, like one second wavelets, and I, um, uh, I asserted that I was looking at, uh, uh, I was looking at, at frequencies with an accuracy. That uh, that didn't make sense to the reviewers, and so they rejected the paper. Okay, and at least what I was doing was not entirely wrong because um, because the uh, what I was doing is I was snipping it out and then I was padding it with zeros. Okay, so I did have more time. I just didn't have any more data, and then Fourier transforming it and looking at the spectra. Okay, so the reviewers, you know, they. They correctly pointed out that I hadn't explained how I got the stated frequency resolution given the short snippets of wavelets that I took, um, uh, because I should have just one hertz frequency resolution, um, and uh, uh, and I could have fixed that up. But they also had a good point in that my my um, uh, you know with that those limitations in my in my frequency resolution, you know that just made my results a little more shady. You know, so if I if I had told them that I had zero padded it, and that's how I, you know, up the theoretical, although not the actual uh, frequency resolution, um, you know, they might have they might have they might not have rejected the paper out of hand. Okay, so uh, you know, even my my misunderstanding of this issue had some had some effect on my early career. So there's a chapter in my PhD thesis which is still not published. I don't know if it would be useful. Um, it might be at this point because uh, um, there's a there's a lot of analysis now of uh, pre-stack uh, you know amplitude versus offset frequency versus offset you know this is an analysis back in like 1984 for frequency versus offset so nobody had tried it before and I I flubbed it they rejected my paper uh, but then other people came ten years later and they did it successfully got their papers published. And uh, you know maybe they maybe they heard me talk about it at a meeting, and uh, and I inspired them to do it right. I would be glad of that. <laughs> Other parts of my thesis uh, uh, became really nice publications, so I'm not too worried about it.